Hi there, friends. Zach Elmblad here, somewhere in Kalamazoo. It's summer here in Southwest Michigan. It's a beautiful day, and it's great to be alive. You can probably hear the Growlers baseball game in the background, and I can smell the hot dogs in the air. I hope you enjoyed the pilot episode of Somewhere in Kalamazoo, and today I'm bringing you the real thing. I've got three adventures to share with you today. The first is a bicycle trip down the Portage Bicentennial Trail. The second is a kayaking trip on the Kalamazoo River from D Avenue to Plainwell. And the third is actually outside of Kalamazoo. It's a snorkeling trip, swimming with manatee in Crystal River, Florida. Here in Kalamazoo, there's lots to do, there's lots to see. And I hope to show you as much of it as I possibly can. I don't really know what else to say about my town other than it has a funny name. It's somewhere between Detroit and Chicago, almost halfway in fact. And we've got all sorts of beautiful spaces that a lot of people don't even seem to know about. From here on the Kalamazoo River Valley Trail, I'm Zach Elmblad coming to you from somewhere in Kalamazoo. Enjoy. Hi, I'm Zach Elmblad. And I'm Kevin Sharon. Here, somewhere, in Kalamazoo. God. <laughs> No, no, no. <laughs> uh, hey! On today's episode of Somewhere in Kalamazoo, we take you down one of the many bike paths in the area, the Portage Bicentennial Trail. A short jaunt from Center to Kilgore, passing through the Celery Flats, over Millam on a steel bridge, and under Interstate 94. I'm riding today with my friend Kevin. Ever since we were kids, Kevin and I have been adventuring all over the country. We grew up interested in the same outdoor activities, so we never had to worry about finding someone to go hiking in the mountains, kayaking over a dam, scuba diving in Florida, climbing a 200-foot rock wall in the desert, crawling into sewers to find a geocache, or biking 15 miles on a Saturday morning. We took our first trips as Cub Scouts in the mid-90s, as we got into middle school and high school, Kevin and I took trips with his dad to Colorado to hike up Mount Albert outside of Leadville, south to West Virginia with our buddy Mike to climb in the New River Gorge, and north to Isle Royal with two of Kevin's uncles. We started riding the Bicentennial Trail back when we were kids. As a quick weekend ride, there was nothing more convenient growing up. It's safe for families to take their kids on, and in the 90s it was great for us all to learn how to rollerblade as well. There's been many additions to the trail over the years, and the most recent was the addition of the access area on the corner of Kilgore and Lover's Lane. As the trail passes underneath Interstate 94, there's a sign showing that the trail runs at nearly the exact center point between Detroit and Chicago. This little geographical fact has always helped us to explain where Kalamazoo is when we meet people from across the country and around the world. There's an event on the trail today, and there's all sorts of people running, walking, biking, rollerblading, skateboarding, riding in wagons, and even running on four legs. It's good to see the public trail system being put to such good use on a fantastic Saturday morning in southwest Michigan. Today's event is the Run for the Cure, a nationwide fitness challenge aimed at raising awareness of breast cancer. It was really congested at some points, which made it difficult to ride, but it was good to see so many people out enjoying the day. In our mid-twenties, Kevin and I took a series of cross-country road trips that took us as far east as New York, as far south as Texas, west to Las Vegas and San Francisco, up the Pacific coast to Oregon and Washington, over the Cascades and Rockies, through the Badlands and High Plains, along the banks of the Mississippi, 
eating pizza in the Red River Gorge and walking through Central Park at two in the morning looking for a good sandwich. We've now taken up recording our adventures around home, and we'll be discussing how to plan for bigger globetrotting trips as the show progresses. Some places we'd like to take you outside of Kalamazoo are down the Fall Golly River Dam release in West Virginia, to our favorite pizza place in the country, Miguel's Pizza at the Red River Gorge in Kentucky, a romp through Dolly Sod's National Wilderness Area, also in West Virginia, up north to Canada for some dock building and kayaking, our return to Colorado to conquer Mount Albert once and for all, and even on two big trips to climb Mount Kilimanjaro in Tanzania and to hike the Inca Trail in Peru. Some of these places we've been before, and some will be items on our bucket list that we plan to get done in the next five years. Hopefully you'll enjoy this effort to combine our love for adventures with our love for sharing them. Stick with us for more adventures in Kalamazoo and as we train and plan for some really big adventures abroad. Kevin spotted something in the trees on the right-hand side. Upon further examination, we realized that it was quite an elaborate tree fort. We were kind of surprised to find it there of all places, and we couldn't help but go ahead and take a look. As kids, we built plenty of forts in the small parks around the Millwood area where we grew up, but nothing like this. As far as tree forts are considered, you can't do much better than this one. The deck was approximately 10 by 10, with a wooden awning, access from beneath, and an old truck toolbox for storage of whatever some kids might need. All that was left was half of a BB container. Whoever built this put a great deal of time and effort into constructing it, and the nearest residential area is at least a half a mile away. I'm sure there was some adult supervision and assistance, but any kid with a tree fort like this 
has clearly done a great deal of labor to make it happen. We've got to admire that kind of tenacity. When most kids these days spend their summers in the basement on Xbox Live or watching TV and eating donuts. We hope that this side quest on the Bicentennial Trail gives you an idea of how Kevin and I approach adventuring. We plan a route, but we don't have any problem with taking time to explore the unexpected things that we find along the way. While it may be important to plan a trip before you head out, don't keep yourself to a rigid timeline, or you may miss some cool stuff along the way. The Kalamazoo area is filled with hiking and biking trails, wooded areas, rivers, and lakes. This is just a taste of what we've been filming this summer, and we have a lot more to show you. Today, Kevin and I are kayaking on the Kalamazoo River. We've done several sections of the river, but this is our current favorite. Running from a private access site off of D Avenue, north of the city, to downtown Plainwell, the stretch takes about two to three hours at a leisurely pace and passes over a removed dam that provides an opportunity to get a little whitewater action. It's very easy to get out and portage back up river in order to run the dam again and again. We've lost hats, shoes, camera batteries, and our self-respect on that dam. It's fun to swim and provides us with hours of entertainment. When we tell stories about kayaking on and swimming in the Kalamazoo River, most people begin to start telling jokes about growing extra limbs or becoming some type of radioactive beast. This is due to the history of the river and Kalamazoo itself. Many years before any of us were born, the Kalamazoo River was an unbridled drainage system for the spring snowmelt and summer rains of southwest Michigan. It was a source of food for indigenous tribes, as well as a source of transportation west to Lake Michigan. Throughout the 19th century, agriculture and fur trapping became big business in the area as Michigan achieved statehood. The Kalamazoo River would have been just as important as any other river in the nation as a source of food, transportation, and irrigation. 
In the beginning of the 20th century and into the post-war era, the Kalamazoo area became known for the manufacture of paper products and pharmaceuticals, which commonly followed the indigenous people's use of the river as a place to discard waste. Although the impact of human waste in the river was negligible for hundreds of years, the local ecology was not able to handle the dumping of toxic wastes such as DDT and PCBs. The pattern of pollution has continued into the 21st century with the Enbridge oil spill just a few years ago. In 1990, the Kalamazoo River was placed on the priority list of the National Superfund. In my opinion, the community of Kalamazoo and national interests in the area have made valiant efforts to clean up the problems of the last 200 years. In some of the sections of the river we've traveled, there are very few signs that industry ever even existed. In other parts, however, there are still many testaments to the industrial history of the area. Where many see ruin and turn away, Kevin and I see the possibility to enjoy what is left and to monitor the progress of the last four years of cleanup, conservation, and development. The people that don't enjoy this source of natural beauty and recreation are truly missing out. Those who give up too early always regret it, and those who press on are always rewarded. We haven't passed any other boaters on the river today, which is a shame considering how nice it is outside. However nice the isolation may be, we'd like to see other people enjoying the river as much as we are. Even though there weren't many people, there were a lot of animals sharing the river with us today. As we drifted, we came across groups of turtles warming themselves on the fallen trees along the banks. A blue heron led us through the forest stretches, and the chirps and chatters of various other creatures broke the silence as we paddled along.
I'm Zach Elmblad. And I'm Kevin Sharon. Here, somewhere, in Kalamazoo. God. <laughs> Today, we're a thousand miles away from Kalamazoo, on the western coast of Florida, snorkeling with manatee on the Crystal River. This was a day trip on our March 2014 scuba diving adventure. This trip was a welcome diversion after our Naui open water training, sponsored by Subaquatic Sports and Services in Battle Creek, and was serviced by American Pro Dive Center in Crystal River, Florida. Manatee are an underwater mammal that have earned a special place in the hearts of underwater sporting enthusiasts and conservation-minded eco-folks around the world. The Florida manatee is at a distinct disadvantage as commercial and private shipping lanes wreak havoc on their natural habitat. Being largely sedentary and not capable of swift maneuvering underwater, the manatee find it very difficult to escape the whirring propellers on boats often finding themselves severely damaged after an unfortunate encounter. Special habitats like the Crystal River have been set aside for the manatee, which also allows these types of trips to occur. Manatee generally occupy waters above 68 degrees Fahrenheit, favoring the warm coastal and inland waters of the Gulf of Mexico, the Caribbean, and northern South America. These gentle sea cows have become severely endangered, and it's up to us as a global community to take care of our seagrass munching friends. Suck up that pride and swallow hate. Mind your manners or you'll drown in the lake. I want to save you, but I think I'm too late. You were already drowning before I could reach the gate.
last thing we see as we sink below the waves is a shattered reflection of time and space. I see your sorrow and you see my regret. The best memories are ones you never forget. Thank <laughs> you.